I've been sharing on the subject of prayer, the power of God, and faith, perhaps running together a little bit from last night, just right on into this morning. I'm wanting to incorporate a few other concepts as well. I might just mention that on our book display, which uh, our little section of it, this is the only day it will be there, there are some large tape albums and you can open those and choose individual tapes. You don't have to buy the whole album, which I think has about 20 different tapes. If there's some particular message you want, you can go over there and just take the album and sit down and go through it and choose maybe one or two tapes that you're interested in. But take advantage of that little section of the display. There's also two uh, magazine books. Anything that you purchase, you can choose free. A copy of William McDonald's book, a copy of Oswald J. Smith's Salvation of God. I was with dear Brother Smith just shortly before he died. He was celebrating his 96th birthday. Wanted to go home to be with Jesus. Billy Graham had been arranged for years to speak at the funeral. Amazing. I don't know how he handles that because he has a very tight schedule. Whether he phoned Oswald up and said, look, this week would be convenient <laughs> or, or phoned God or what. But what a great funeral, funeral it was there in People's Church, a church that last year there in Canada committed equal to about 800,000 pounds sterling to world missions. One church. And uh, Paul Smith Oswald J. Smith's father is the past, uh, son is the pastor of that uh, church. So you can get that free. It's actually a book about salvation, all that we have through salvation. You know, sometimes in our efforts to convince people about other experiences of God's grace that come after we're saved, we belittle the work of salvation. But you know, this... There's no greater thing that can ever happen in your spiritual life than being saved. And if any of you are not yet saved at this point, I'm sure Les or Andrew or others here would be thrilled to talk to you. Or maybe you want to read this book, The Salvation of God. A lot of people have paid three, two pounds for that book. You can get it free with any other book. And I wanted to mention just four other titles that are there on the STL display, improving your serve. This man is the most gifted communicator I know of this decade in writing. In fact, he can really intimidate. His chapter on cliches just about put me into depression. But I, I'm amazed at the gift God has given this man. He's a pastor again. Christ called to unselfish living, Charles Swindoll. A brilliant book. You know, sometimes I think it's pride that keeps us from reading books. We think, well, I already know that. I've met people, uh, married people. I don't read any books on marriage. They're all American books anyway. <laughs> Three years later, his marriage blows into two, and he writes his book on divorce. But I think uh, often pride keeps us from learning. And I thank God that somehow, by his grace, he has taught many of us to keep our L plates on all of our life. And there's a book you can learn from. Improving Your Serve, the British edition, much cheaper than the old edition. Ishmael, my brother, a compendium on understanding Muslims. A brilliant book, a study book. Not a book you're going to read through in a few uh, hours. A biblical course on Islam. A number of OM and XOM people have contributed to this book. For security reasons, their names, I don't think, appear. Just take a look at that. Ishmael, my brother. Right? Write it down there in your notes. Hitchhiker's Guide to Missions. It's a funny title. I didn't even know they had hitchhiking in England. Is that a term we're using in England now, hitchhiking? I guess on the continent it's called autostop or something like that. Ada Lum, an Asian, writes a guide on, on how to get started in missions, and it's a very, very, very helpful book. I'm in the midst of reading it myself. Lastly, flirting with the world. So much confusion reigns among young people. What can I do? 
What's allowed? What's not allowed? Am I allowed to drink wine if I'm a Christian? Am I allowed to, you know, a little hashish now and then? Can I go to the flicks? You know, am I allowed to kiss my girlfriend? What's worldliness? What length should my hair be? Can I wear earrings if I'm a man? On the right or the left side, what's worldliness? Well, this is one of the very best books on the subject, written by a psychologist, born-again believer from Lancashire, now lives in Canada, John White. Flirting with the world. What a gold mine of Christian literature. I'm known for hardly ever introducing people in meetings. I don't like to take my preaching time. But I would like to introduce a very dear friend, one of the first persons I ever met. When I came to England, who joined OM in 1963, I phoned him up from Wales. I said, look, we're in trouble in Paris. The tent is falling down. Uh, we need older, mature, wise help. And Alf Ridpath of the Midlands was off. Alf, would you stand up? I, we wouldn't ask your age, but we know you're not 40 anymore. It's great to have you here. If you want some wise counsel, you see Alf Ridpath. He'll even take you to Israel in the process. God bless you, Ralph. Alf, it's good to see you. He's often, he's probably taking care of more OM bookstalls than anybody in the British Isles. Keswick Convention and many, many other places. And appreciate him being with us here this morning. Ephesians 6. Ephesians 6. How can we increase our faith? That's what it says in your little program. I always like to grab the program when I come in and see what I'm supposed to be speaking on. And then I usually try to blend that together with what the Holy Spirit has put on my heart for today. And what the Holy Spirit has put on my heart for today is the reality of the spiritual warfare and how to stand firm in the faith, how to increase our faith in the midst of the spiritual warfare. Ephesians 6 is one of the great spiritual warfare chapters. Let's read the Word of God. I started memorizing this authorized version as a baby Christian 30 years ago. And somehow, as I have so many hundreds of verses memorized in the authorized, I have trouble getting away from it. But I believe in the other translations, and you can follow in your modern translation. But let's start at verse 10. Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God, and you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. That's strong, isn't it? You may even see that today. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. You, you mark that. My Bible study was revolutionized as a baby Christian when I began to mark my Bible. That Bible was so precious to me. And you know, I lost that Bible around 1963, somewhere in Europe. I don't know, I may have in a moment of fervent heat given it away uh, to someone. Last year at Easter evangelism in Germany, a man walked up to me and he presented me with that old Bible that had been lost for 20 years. And I read my notes and uh, noticed the underlining I put in it some 30, almost 30 years ago. So I have that Bible back. What an illustration. Once I was lost, but now I'm found. <laughs> but I hope you'll mark your Bible. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness. It's not singular, brothers and sisters, it's plural, of this world. You get the two extremes. Some people uh, exaggerate God's control over the world, and other people underestimate God's control over the world. Perhaps one theologically might be thought of as an extreme Arminian, though it would be a particular kind of Arminian. The other might be an extreme Calvinist. He'd be a particular kind of 
Calvinists. How hard to find the balance, this whole area of the sovereignty of God and the free will of man. I believe as John Stott that we find both clearly in the word of God. Verse 13, wherefore take unto you the whole armor of God that ye may be able to withstand in the evil day and having done all to stand. Stand therefore. Perseverance. Stand therefore. Having your loins girded about with truth, having on the breastplate of righteousness, your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace, above all taking the shield of faith with which ye shall be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked. That's our key verse, verse 16. Taking the shield of faith and take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God, praying always. That's a strong word, isn't it? Praying always with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit and watching thereunto with all perseverance and supplication for all saints. And for me that utterance may be given unto me that I may open my mouth boldly to make known the mystery of the gospel for which I am an ambassador in bonds that in this I may speak boldly as I ought to speak. God has called us into a great spiritual warfare. The largest dimension of the warfare is in our own hearts. I was reading this morning a book called uh, Why Can't I Do uh, What I Want to Do? That's a paraphrase by a man named Bacchus, William Bacchus. His books are not known yet in this country, but one of my goals for 1986 is to make William Bacchus's book known, books known from one end of England to the other, a privilege that's been given to us in the ministry of Operation Mobilization. As we have men reaching out to almost every single Christian bookshop in this nation in our mobile van service. And I've been reading this man's amazing books, a combination of biblical insights from the Word of God and scientific understanding of man and his mind and his problems. A tough subject to say the least. An easy one to go into extremes. I remember when I was a young missionary in India, picking up a book, The Psychology of Jesus in Mental Health. I thought, what a strange title. I so thank God for that book. It was actually an exposition on the Sermon on the Mount. Because there's more biblical psychology in the Sermon on the Mount than you'd find in many chapters in a psychology book. And I learned something about casting every care upon him, upon the Lord. As you know, in the Sermon on the Mount, it talks about beholding the lilies of the field. You know, one of my favorite places is the woods. When I have a spare moment, I go for the woods like bees for honey. You might think this is all housing around here, but when I went out jogging this morning within a few hundred yards of where I was staying, uh, which is just in that old bus you saw down there on the main road, I found a beautiful park right over there. Late, I thought uh, these swans actually were going to attack me. I've heard of these swans do attack joggers. Now that I think of it, I'm not sure they were swans. But it was early in the morning, you know, you can't recognize all the birds early in the morning. But Jesus said, Behold the lilies of the field. Behold the birds of the air. You know, John Stott is known as, as an outstanding ornithologist. Do you know that? This man who expounds the word of God and travels and writes so many books, spends hours with his binoculars out in the woods watching uh, the birds. I heard he spent hours just watching one particular species. Amazing. I'd love to get a picture of him out in the woods. There's a little cottage down in Wales where he does a lot of his writing. Behold the fowls of the air. He speaks about this being greater than Solomon in all of his glory. You know, the Christian life is, is, is not some frenzied, you know, uh, self-effort in which we're, we're constantly trying to be better and we're constantly trying to do more and we're endlessly on edge about this and about that. 
The Christian life is a restful life. The kind of faith we're trying to talk to you about in these days is a faith that brings stability. It's a faith that brings calm in the midst of the storm. It's a faith that enables you to keep your head when everybody else is losing theirs. It's a faith that enables you after perhaps a, 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 the shock of a terrible motor accident to do what needs to be done in getting the necessary help and ministering to those who are injured rather than perhaps running around the vehicle screaming, oh no, oh no, oh no, why did God allow this? And God is wanting to build up our faith in many, many ways. And as I shared last night, one of the mistakes at times or miscommunications in OM has been to communicate a faith that is too narrow. It doesn't take in the wide spectrum of all that God is doing. And of course, we need to understand that whether we're working out on the streets in evangelism this morning or we're coming in early as this barrage of automobiles came to this auto works factory this morning, if we are believers, we are in a spiritual warfare. We may be in a factory where someone is purposely, or an office, jabbing at our faith. They're purposely doing things to us to test our uh, so-called sanctification. And some of you know that experience. And we need faith to stand firm in the midst of a storm. The day after our uh, leaders' training conference in Manchester, a tremendous storm blew across Britain. Amazing. Roofs were blown off. Trees were across the highways. All kinds of things took place. And there's a real sense that the Christian is living in a storm. And we speak here of, of fiery darts. Other translations say flaming arrows. It speaks here of satanic devices. A word for that, perhaps in modern England, modern English is, is strategy. Verse 11, the wiles of the devil. Probably your translation has something else. Well, what does your translation have here? Wiles of the devil. Verse 11. Schemes. What other word? Attacks. Tricks. Lots of different words to say the same thing. Now, here's the problem. We read these things, but it doesn't get into us. And I observed this in the people in OM over these 30 years. That, that so often we, we read these things, we even read books about these things, we even discuss these things, but we don't live in the light of it. We don't live in the light of it. We haven't appropriated it into our real spiritual bloodstream. And of course, this is one of Satan's tactics. Satan's tactics, even as we sit here this morning, we're all tired. Why pay attention? Why observe any of this? We want to get out. We, we, we get all types, you know, we get the impatient types. They always want to get out in the evangelism. When they're in the evangelism, they want to get back to have supper. When they're having supper, they, they, they can't wait to do something they wanted to do after summer, supper or after tea. And God has been dealing a lot with me. I'm a, I'm, a, I'm a long, you know, it takes a long time to get through to me on some things. Just to live one day at a time. And even to live one hour at a time. This hour we have right now, which will include some prayer, is, is, is very important. I know in my own experience, this will be the first and last time that I will ever see some of you. Life is big. The world is big. People are on the move. There's many a person, in fact, tens of thousands, I have seen once, I've spoken to once, and I've never seen them again. That's why it's always an encouragement to get a letter from such people. And they say, I heard you speak uh, at Urbana in 1968. We've never met, but at that night, I recommitted my life to Jesus Christ, and I'm here working in Brazil as a missionary and I just wanted you to know that was the crossroad of my life. Those kind of letters can help encouragement, bring encouragement at that time. So Satan will try to counterattack us even in the meetings here. Maybe someone will be sharing something and we feel, oh, well, I've heard that before. 
You know, in any ministry, there's got to be wheat and straw. If you listen to me, you get very worse straw. Some of it is actually quite funny. No problem. Just throw it away or make a pillow out of it or whatever. We learned that in Boy Scouts, the old straw pillows. Sneeze all night. You got hay fever. But I don't think you can live. I don't think you can read books. I don't think you can have conversation or do anything without what I call the straw factor. Oh, that would be a good title for a book, wouldn't it? There's so many books coming out. To find a new title, you've got to be almost an, you know, an imagination gypsy. Uh, and, uh, that would be a good title. What do you think of that? Straw Factor with a picture of a bunch of OMers on the cover. <laughs> and when you're reading and when you're listening, don't worry about the Straw Factor. You just keep looking for the wheat. God has some kernels here. Don't worry if one speaker who maybe comes a couple days from now seems to disagree a little bit with maybe something I've said or something you've read. God's unity is not uniformity. We don't grill the speakers and make them sign some kind of OM pledge before they come here. OM is very broad-minded in, in many ways. Some people can't handle that. There are many, many, many groups around England where I could never get in the door to speak. Never. Because they're afraid I would rock the boat. They're afraid I would say something that would, would uh, you know, perhaps bring disunity to their congregation. They're trying to get all their people to believe this way. And they, they don't want someone in there to rock the boat, say something that might, you know, disagree with what their leaders are saying. In OM, we actually bring in speakers who we know on some points may disagree with some of the things we're saying. You have to sort this out before God. We don't agree. I don't agree with everything written in these books that, that we have there, every line, every chapter. But we believe people have to study. They have to have their ears open. And we find that people who, who are open to listening to different messages and, and, and they, they're able to go through that, ultimately, they are more mature. Ultimately, they are more balanced. Ultimately, they are less threatened in their faith. On our ships, we sell educational books. Some of them are written by unbelievers. We've had incredible letters, faith-destroying books. What about all the Christians who have to go to university and study to get a degree in history, English literature, philosophy? Is it impossible to be a dedicated Christian and go through a course in psychology, philosophy? Many of us have hothouse or greenhouse Christianity. And we try to keep it well protected. And we don't want to read any secular books. We don't want to look at any secular films. We certainly don't want to listen to any secular music. Wow, there's a Christian listening to Capital Radio. <laughs> or Birmingham Beat. I don't know what you have up here. Personally, I find it incredibly helpful to just keep a little bit of an ear to what in the world is going on around me, what the young people are thinking, what they're listening to. I try to do it very much in moderation, but it has certainly helped me understand where this generation is. And many of the men that are leaders in Operation Mobilization actually have graduated from Cambridge or Oxford or Wheaton College or uh, the University of Stuttgart or some university in Sweden. In fact, just over a year ago, a young man who had been in and out of OM named Ingemar Emker after getting higher education in Sweden, became a member of the Swedish Diplomatic Corps to Africa. He later became a representative of the Swedish government to the United Nations. And it was only after many years in that that somehow God spoke to him about rejoining Operation Mobilization. And what a dynamo this man was. What a stallion of the grace of God as he came galloping back through Operation Mobilization. I've written a tribute to this brother who was killed in a motor accident in Sweden shortly after he left OM to go back into the Swedish government service, a country we should be praying for, especially considering the assassination of their prime minister some weeks ago. We're not afraid of education. We're not threatened by philosophy or psychology. We are aware that Satan uses these things. And if you get into this kind of study without the whole armor of God, without a strong prayer life, without also getting into powerful Christian books and the Word of God, you, of course, are probably going to get wiped out. 
But the man who has the armor of God on, the man who has the shield of faith, the man who is standing firm in his prayer life, he can go through these studies. He can be involved in a secular occupation, even with the United Nations or his own government, and he can be strong in his faith. A lot of people are now laughing because Pat Robertson has announced that he may run for president of the United States. You know, most of us don't understand people from other countries. We don't understand even the people in our own country. We evaluate people by newspaper clippings, by generalizations. And you know, when I first heard about this man, my typical verwer cynicism, skepticism, just like when I heard the conversion of Charles Colson, rose to a very great degree. And, uh, you know, I guess Tozer's had a little bit of an influence on me. He said, let's not believe everything. He said, it's important as Christians to develop a little bit of reverent skepticism. But, you know, I found Charles Colson just like an onion. The more I peeled, the, real, the more real uh, the whole thing became. And I will tell you, Charles Colson is as real as rain. And if you don't know that, anything about that in Birmingham will move to Manchester. And I'll tell you, Pat Robertson, personally, I'm not sure whether he should run for president of the United States. Arthur Blessett ran for president of the United States. He's 16 times more wild and unpredictable than Pat Robertson. And I tell you, every time I listen to Arthur Blessett, I've been listening to his tapes again. He actually spoke at Easter Evangelism once. I listened to the tape three times. It just blesses me right out of my running shoes. And when old Arthur Blessett hit that traditional wonderful Westminster Chapel, still living in the smog of Dr. Martin Lloyd-Jones. Because one thing about disciples is they usually go further than their teachers, and some of the little disciples of Lloyd-Jones got way beyond anything that he ever taught or preached. And they didn't know the reality of the Holy Spirit and the freedom of the Holy Spirit that he knew in the midst of his strong Reformed doctrine. And I personally think that Arthur Blessed is more like Lloyd-Jones than most people would dare to even imagine and he just had another campaign there. And I will tell you, when you see all these dear, proper English people moving out into the streets of London, including the pastor, R.T. Kendall, winning all kinds of people to Jesus Christ, you know that a wind of God has just blown through. And the more I've looked at this man, Pat Robertson, the more I've discovered that some of the jokes are just that, they're jokes. Because he's a brilliant man, he's a widely read man, he understands politics, he's a son of a senator, he's not just, uh, you know, a TV uh, charismatic leader. Life is complicated, isn't it? People are complicated. And this is why my plea for your faith to be strengthened, that you may live a Christian life in the, in the midst of a secular society, that you may, if necessary, be a on fire soldier of Jesus Christ in the marketplace, in the factory, in the office, as a prison guard. That's quite a challenge. A friend that I led to Christ in high school became a prison guard in California in order to earn money to get his legal degree. He's now the deputy district attorney in Boulder, Colorado. I just had lunch with him and he shared with me the difficult job he had of putting away a man who hired a hitman to go and stone his wife to death. My friend had to go from, Cal from, from Colorado to Florida and get that man and bring him back to Colorado and prosecute him in court and put him in prison. How can this be? How can we do these things if we're Christians? Can we be a policeman if we're a Christian? Can we be a, a politician? Can we be a company director? Or are, are dedicated Christians only allowed to, to be missionaries? <laughs> They're only allowed to join OM and uh, reach out to India and the Muslim world. Praise God in Christian work, including OM, we are in desperate need of full-time workers. And we find in some places an extreme teaching that gives the idea everybody must be in secular work. This is the only way to prove yourself. They even say Christian work is, is just a cop-out. I've seen people really try to intimidate people in full-time Christian work. How sad that we can't just respect one another more. 
How sad that we can't have the kind of faith that, that incorporates the other man. You know, a lot of times I believe we have um, lack of discernment in being, in being able to distinguish between something God has given us and something that just comes from within our own temperament. Let me read this quote from A.W. Tozer. It requires great care. It requires great care and a true knowledge of ourselves to distinguish a spiritual burden from a religious irritation. That's, that's hot. I hope you have a, a quote book. Do you have a quote book? When you get a red hot quote, you clip it out and paste it in there or you write it in there. How many have a quote book? That's been one of the keys in my whole ministry. Well, obviously, you're young. You're just getting started. And I, I keep losing my quote book being a bit of a scatterbrain. So now I write some of the red hot quotes in my Bible. I found all these blank pages. And I thought, well, this must be for some purpose. Everything has a purpose is one of my beliefs. That's why I save too many things. And then I found all these maps and I, I couldn't figure out how to use those. So I wrote some more notes and quotations <laughs> over those maps. And I've got this Tozer quotation right here next to Ephesians 6, so it's convenient. Let me read it again because this is, this is spiritual meat. It requires great care and a true knowledge of ourselves to distinguish a spiritual burden from a religious irritation. And often acts done in a spirit of religious irritation have consequences far beyond anything we can guess. It's always more important that we remain or retain a right spirit toward others than that we bring them around to our way of thinking, even if our way is right. Satan cares little whether we go astray after false doctrine or mainly turn sour. Either way, he wins. You know, as the buffets of life hit you, here's a Verwer quotation. You want to get a Verwer quotation? There's not many of them. They're any good. As the buffets of life hit you, you are going to become either bitter or balanced. How's that? Why don't you write it down? <laughs> Probably someone else has already said it. Certainly in a paraphrase. As you go out along life's road, listen, young people, you are going to be hit. Many of you are going to have the broken romance experience. Whoopee! Just what you were always thinking about, right? A broken romance experience. How does it go? You meet this wonderful woman. Everything you ever dreamed of. I had a horrific dream last night. I can't explain what happened. But I was compelled to draw this gun and shoot this girl right in the neck. <laughs> and as the dream went on, she just sat there. And the bullet was sticking out the back of her neck. And I thought to myself, this was in my dream, I shouldn't have done that. And I was trying to figure out, how am I going to get this bullet out of her neck? And I was really worried, and the dream went on, and somehow she then became aware of it. And you know how dreams are a bit bizarre. And she started to die, and then I thought she's going to be paralyzed like Jonathan McCrosty, uh, and all kinds of things. And somehow, toward the end of the dream, she got to a hospital. They got the bullet out. I was praying. I was praying in my dream that she would not die. And they got the bullet out, and she lived. And then someone woke me up and gave me a cup of tea. <laughs> if you want to know how complicated your mind is, you, you just keep a record of your dreams. But I tell you, I don't, put much, uh, I don't put much stock in my dreams. I've heard the whole books about dreams, and I'm not even going to read them. I, those books will lead me to worse dreams. <laughs> now I forgot what I was talking about. What was I talking about? I gave you that quote about being bitter or balanced and the fact that as you go out along life's road, you're, you're going to get hit. And then I started talking about uh, the broken romance experience. So you meet little Sally and uh, you're in love with her and she's the greatest thing and you're praying and you got a word from the Lord and you got a, a prophecy from Joe Blow down the road who's drinking too much coffee and you're convinced this is the one. And then you start to get together and you go out and see the witness together and uh, fall even more in love as you watch that. And then something happens. 
Luigi down the end of the road comes into the scene. Sally flips out when she sees Luigi, uh, and she writes you, Dear John, I really appreciated you, but uh, I don't think we're really compatible. Um, Luigi and I are getting married in a few weeks, and we, we really would like you to have a nice spirit about this, and we'd like you to come uh, to the wedding and, and serve the punch at the reception. <laughs> Now, we can laugh. I want to tell you, I believe we're dealing with more damaged emotions among young people over broken romance than any other single factor today. Perhaps the only thing that competes with it is horrific things that have happened in the home in their childhood. And it is a great mistake, young person, if you put too much uh, faith in, in feelings of romance. Most people go through at least one broken romance. And if you think that's the end of the world and you take on a rejection syndrome because of that or you become bitter or whatever else, you overreact in some other way, you're making one of the most basic and yet most horrific in some ways mistake, mistakes in your life. We get people running into OM as a result of a broken romance. They were going to spend the summer with little Susie Q in the Costa Brava. That all blew up over Easter. When at uh, spring harvest, she met another guy, and you're there, down in the blues, uh, wondering what to do, and somehow a piece of OM literature about the summer campaign floats through your window. You know, we got some very active OMers that are running around actually just pitching this stuff into people's windows. And you think, oh boy, if I got involved with OM and active, uh, maybe I'd be able to get my mind off this broken romance. By the way, that's not such a bad thing, to stay active when you're in the midst of this kind of difficulty because the passive, retreating, sitting mind is a mind that the enemy can easily get into. So we, we don't mind if the Holy Spirit is in control. If someone comes on OM in the summer, they'll have to go through preparation, some books and some tapes. We hope the Lord will sort them out in the process. What's the purpose of talking about great faith to reach the Muslim world, great faith to see churches planted in Mongolia, great faith to, to go out into the streets even today. If we, don't have to if we don't have the faith to appropriate a broken heart from a broken love affair, which involves believing in the sovereignty of God, that even if somehow that was plan A and the woman got away from God and so plan A collapsed, that God can bring in plan B. Do you think finding the will of God is some kind of blueprint thing? You just pray enough and get blessed up enough and read enough and suddenly the blueprint is going to come down from heaven, where you're to go, who you're to marry, what, what salary you're going to get and all of that. I was jogging along my favorite coastline of Britain there in Pembrokeshire listening to Paul Little now with the Lord through an automobile accident and he was speaking about the will of God and boy did he attack that blueprint program. Tony Campalo also attacks the Blueprint program, and I want to join in the list. Often life is one step at a time, and we become neurotic worrying about our future and our career, and we feel intimidated if at 18 we don't know exactly what we're going to study and exactly what we're going to be and exactly where we're going to go. Listen, my friends, study a little history because many of the greatest men and women of God didn't have a clue what they were going to do to some degree when they were 18 and 19 in terms of specifics. Basic foundation is far more important. You're going to worship God. You're going to love God. You're going to love your fellow men. You're going to grow in grace and a knowledge of Him. You're going to find commitment with balance. You're going to keep learning. You're going to develop humility. You're going to learn about prayer, waiting on God. Then He can add. The word is very clear. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and His righteousness, and all these things will be added unto you. That failure you have gone through can be the greatest stepping stone to success. That brokenness or broken romance could teach you more about life and what it is to handle rejection. It's actually the psychological factor that's the biggest. It's linked with the ego. It's not really the, the love for a woman factor that is the biggest. It's the rejection. It's the loneliness. It's the deep feeling of maybe I'm not going to ever make it in life or ever get married or no one loves me. It's the self-pity puddle. And these things can drain us from faith like a missile hitting the bottom of the doulos. Oh, Lord, never let that happen. In <laughs> Jesus' name, amen. Faith.
faith when the hard things of life hit you. Have any of you been at the funeral of one of your own parents? Some here, I'm sure, have. My dad's 80. I, I don't know how I'll face it. Even though he's lived a full life, I mean, God can take him at any time. He's 80 years of age. To me, it will still be an, a very, very overwhelming emotional experience. I'm close to my father. He's given everything ever since I can remember. He did everything he ever could to help me along in life's road. As an unconverted man, he did more than most of the converted fathers that I've ever heard about. Someday, he'll go. And some of you have lost your father when you were five or six, or your mothers. Others of you have been through divorce. It's not the end of the road, young person. Don't let the trauma of any experience keep you from the joy of the Lord, keep you from an optimistic life of faith. Anybody can see the problems. Anybody can see the mountains. But it takes men and women of faith to move those mountains. It takes men and women of faith to climb over those mountains or to tunnel through them. There's many strategies for mountains. Take the shield of faith wherewith you can stop the fiery darts of Satan. Some basic principles, I've written them down here in my Bible, that have helped me grow in faith. I'd like to just share with you as I bring this, try to bring this to a close. Just some things that uh, I try to put into practice every day, every week, that, that just build my faith up. Number one, I remind myself, and we do need to remind ourselves, Lloyd-Jones in his brilliant book, Spiritual Depression, Its Cause and the Cure, the one book I hope you'll get, if you can't get any others. He even believed in talking to himself. When he found his emotions, do you know anything about mood swings, you know, up and down? Any of you have any difficulty in that area? Big thing with me, I'll tell you. And I've learned how to get control of those mood swings. So now instead of, you know, this way, they're sort of, you know, more and more, not, not so wide. And Lloyd-Jones is very, very strong about this need to really discipline our minds. I mean, let me share this. It's so important. I, this is one of the burdens I've been speaking about a lot. We believe in salvation. We believe in the filling of the Holy Spirit. OM has a large number who use baptism of the Holy Spirit terminology. Others use filling of the Spirit terminology. We love to hear what Billy Graham says, speaking about the Spirit-filled life. He said, I don't care how you get it. Just get it. The one thing we need to understand, no matter how filled you are with the Holy Spirit, no matter what crisis you have with God, no matter what deliverance you may go through, that doesn't liquidate the need to daily deny self, take up the cross, and follow Him. And I believe that's where the problem is today. We've got hundreds of thousands in Britain who have had crisis experiences with God and the Holy Spirit. Some of them have them every summer. The main thing Christians do in the, flummer, in the summer is flock to conventions and, and, and get saturated more with the Word of God. We are producing more and more truth gluttons. Their heads are filled and their hearts are still cold and chilly because they haven't gone out and put it into practice. That's why I know some of you have come here. You have been to conventions before. You have been through conferences before. You have heard a lot of good Bible teaching and Bible preaching. More Bible teachers per capita in Britain than any country I've ever visited in the world except the States. But putting it into practice is something else. And I believe we make a mistake if after we've been filled with the Spirit and we know Christ, we, we get discouraged again, and so we pray, Lord, touch me. Lord, bless me. Lord, do something in my life. I believe sometimes we are praying that prayer in error. I know this is a little controversial. Hear me out. We are praying that prayer in error because our need at that time is not for God to bless us or lift us up or touch us. You get a lot of Lord touch me prayers. Oh, God, touch me. Touch you. Nothing. He needs to kick you so hard you never stop. <laughs> Jesus said, if any man come after me, let him get my blessing. No, Jesus said, if any man come after me, let him deny himself. Brothers and sisters, the Holy Spirit is in you. That's big business. That's as greatest thing as God can ever do, to put himself, 
by His Spirit in you. And all the potential for godly living and the fruit of the Spirit and the reality of God, it's there in you. And now, by steps of faith, by denying self, by taking up the cross, by discipline, it needs to be released. Let me tell you, if you are discouraged this morning, that's not God's fault. It's not because God doesn't bless. It's not because God isn't real. A lot of people say, God is not real to me. What do you mean God is not real to you? He's living in your heart, you jerk. <laughs> Forgive the terminology. I shouldn't use that word. But we, we, we are being deceived by the enemy. We are failing to live in the light of our inheritance in Jesus Christ. We're squeezing pennies when God has given us $1,000, $1,000 notes. The ball is in your side of the court. Many years ago, I took up tennis. My son was watching Wimbledon. He wanted to play tennis and said, okay, you know, I'm not sure if I can do that in the spirit, but let's <laughs> buy some tennis rackets. And I started to play, play tennis, and I fell in love with that sport. And the great goal of, of many OMers is to beat Verwer at tennis. Very few have. One is sitting here who has. Uh, because there's not many good tennis players. I don't know. Not because I'm any good. But tennis is a simple sport. A child can play it. The ball comes over the net and you hit it back. It's no big deal. Huh? <laughs> when it comes to spiritual life, when it comes to spiritual life, the ball is in your car. If you are a believer, you're indwelt by the Holy Spirit. God's love is there in your heart. The ball is in your car. It is in your court. No, no, don't pray. Lord, send the ball over. It's there. Lord, bless me. Lord, help me. Lord, touch me. Again, there's no problem in praying those prayers. Is is if as you pray, you take the step of faith. If as you pray, you obey. It's as you pray, you do something. I pray for revival, but as I pray for revival, I appropriate revival in my heart. I have preached for years that it is the privilege of every Christian every day to live in personal revival. Stop praying, Lord, revive me. You can claim now revival from God, and you can live in it. I've known it almost every day to varying degrees since almost the day of my conversion. It doesn't mean the absence of the human factor. It doesn't mean that we're never discouraged. We don't have temptations. We don't have difficulties. But it means we experience God in the midst of it and the joy and the peace and the fruit of the Spirit that the Holy Spirit can bring. And you know the problem with many of us? We're intimidated by our mistakes. Mistakes are not an evidence that God is not working in your life. Contrary, those mistakes may, not always, they may be evidence that God is doing something in your life. Anybody that comes into this kind of evangelism at your age in a complicated cross-cultural situation, they're going to make mistakes. That's not because God is absent. That's because you are taking steps of faith during these days. You are going out and doing something some of you have never done tonight. How many of you have never done anything like this really before? Be honest. Raise your hand. Whoa. How many of you have never done it really very much? Yeah. And so the mistakes we make are not evidence that God is not with us. We haven't prayed enough. We're not spiritual enough. So many people write to me, I'm not spiritual enough. Who is spiritual enough? What do we mean by that? And so many t people today, they're intimidated, they're discouraged by their own failures. Failure. Erwin Lutzer speaks about in his book can be the back door to success. And have you seen his book, When a Good Man Falls, about Christian leaders falling into immorality? Wow, what a daredevil writer. Have you seen his little book, Living with Your Passions on the Subject of Sexual Purity? And you know, that's the area where sometimes we make the greatest mistakes. Because generally young people, under the teaching of the word, become hypersensitive about impurity. And if you want to get young people at the altar, just preach about impurity. Just give them the Jesus standard. You know, even if you lusted a woman, you commit adultery in your heart. You just preach on that and give the invitation. They'll, they'll be up. The altars will be full if you have sensitive, normal Christian young people. And some of them will be praying with all their heart. They'll be weeping. They'll be ready to fast. I've seen people do almost the most wild things 
to get victory over impurity. And, and they pray a prayer, something like this, Oh God, I'm believing you, I'm believing you for total, absolute, final, once and for all, total victory over all impurity and all impure thinking. And then we wonder why a few years later, months later, we got so many discouraged people. That's very much linked with that romance factor. They tie in with the number of young people, I dare to say, sitting right here, down in your heart, you're discouraged because you haven't yet had total, final, absolute victory over impurity, lust of the mind, and related things. And then we wonder why people in the world think Christians are neurotics. Right. We are so naive and immature often as Christians in our view of life. Most of the people I've worked with and interviewed around the world, even Christian leaders, don't have and have never experienced total, once and for all, absolute final victory over every, every area of impurity. Especially in the mind, it will be an ongoing struggle for most people. Do you expect to have total, instant, final victory over all forms of pride? You must really be joking. You're going to fight pride the rest of your life in many subtle ways. Some of you are going to fight impatience the rest of your life, and it's not going to be all victories, especially when you get in God's graduate school. I thought I was really getting sanctified around 20. Watch me knee Andrew Murray. I was a soul winner. I was a man of prayer. I was esteemed as a Christian leader. I was pioneering. Oh, I'm in Mexico by 21. I thought, boy, I'm really getting sanctified. God is using me. People were telling me the most ridiculous things about myself. I was beginning to believe it. <laughs> then I got married. <laughs> and I will tell you, God's graduate school exposed more suppressed carnal aspects of George Verwer than I would want to talk about in one meeting. Don't be too worried if at your age you do not know yourself completely. It's impossible. You are growing. You are developing. And don't pray, Lord, reveal all of self to me tonight that I may get the victory. If God reveals all of the hidden ramifications of your self-life in one blow, you will probably get depressed <laughs> or explode. God is gracious. God is a God of grace. He reveals things to us slowly. And we grow in faith. And you can't win next year's victories today. You have to grow and prepare for that battle which will be fought a year from now. So don't pray that marriage comes upon you too quickly. And certainly don't go into marriage thinking it's a mutual program for the satisfaction of particular emotions. Marriage for the believer is a graduate school. It's going to be rough and it's going to be tough and it's going to demand a deeper commitment than OM has ever demanded in evangelizing the world. And without a renewal of the emphasis on commitment in marriage that men like Tony Compalo talk about, we're going to see more and more Christian marriages just end up on the shelf. Because it takes commitment, it takes stickability, it takes the kind of thing we're talking about this morning. Faith in the midst of a crisis, faith in the midst of a storm, spiritual balance, spiritual growth, denying self, personal revival, the shield of faith, stopping that fiery dart. Let me just try to give you these few closing thoughts. Knowing that you were accepted and forgiven, that, that helps me press on in my faith. I constantly remind myself of that. You can look at Ephesians 1, 6. Casting every care upon him, 1 Peter 5, 7. I'm constantly doing that, constantly doing it. Just like hitting the tennis ball back. And I find that some of those worries come back on me just as fast as a McEnroe serve. You better be ready. Number three, making God your goal. Making God your goal even during this week. It's not firstly to win people. It's not firstly to, to uh, give out literature. It's not firstly to do this or do that or win friends or disciple somebody. All that, can, all that can be included. God is our goal. To know him better through this situation. Number four, learning how to be hurt. If you don't want to ever be hurt again, you're in the wrong planet. Yesterday I was hurt. 
I got a heavy letter through the post, and I have to be honest, I got hurt through that very deeply. But I thank God. I was within moments thanking God for the letter, even though I was still struggling. Because I know that God uses hurts. God uses even misunderstandings as much as we don't want them in the work of God to refine us. It's what our Savior went through. Learning how to be hurt. Following the example of Jesus. Not in a masochistic way. Not denying the human factor. Not trying to bring a solution to the problem. We always work with both hands. On one hand, we learn to see what God is doing through the problem. With the other hand, we reach out to solve the problem. If we can only get that together. You get those who are hyper in this area. Never defend yourself. Always lie down. Very passive. I'm suffering. This is going wrong. I'm suffering for the sake of Christ. And then you get others who, who only use this hand. You know, let's charge. Let's change the situation. Let's do this. Let's do that. This is not God's way. This is a disgrace to the work of the kingdom. And you use both hands. The one hand, to some degree, accepts what's happening, patiently tries to discern the situation, rejoices in the midst of the pain and the struggle. With the other hand, he tries to resolve the problem. That includes management, includes administration, it includes communication, it includes peacemaking, it includes a whole number of practical ministries connected with Christian leadership that some of us live in day and night and day and night. We need both those hands. The hand to receive and hold, the hand to move out and change. Balance. In fact, there's not an area of the Christian life where you don't need balance. Number five, learning the reality of praise and thanksgiving. That, that helps my faith. What a gift we have in this generation. Christian music tapes. I was listening to a Christian music tape this morning. And how it just warmed my heart to just praise the Lord together with this person who was praising the Lord on this tape to play one of these Keith Green tapes and just let my heart go out in praise. We should be doing more in the ministry of Christian music and learning how to build our faith through psalms and hymns and spiritual songs as outlined in Ephesians 5. Number six, learning the rest of faith as outlined in Hebrews 4. Is that a crisis? Is that a process? I've thought of it more as a lifestyle. It's a controversial passage, but surely there's something we can glean from it. Seven, realizing God is easy to live with. You get that? That's from Tozer. God is easy to live with. Some people have a uh, sort of neurotic view of God, and they, they, they think of him as a big man with a big stick about to, to hit them if they do anything wrong. We need, a, we need to take a bath in the grace and mercy of God. If I didn't believe God could overrule my mistakes, if I didn't believe that plan B and plan C and plan D in my life or wherever I may be could be as great as plan A, I don't, I don't know how I'd function. I've seen too much. I know too much. God is sovereign. God is on the throne. Romans 8.28 is in the book. He can overrule. Beware of living in defeat because of some failure, some mistake, some moment when you fail to exercise faith. Bounce back. He's easy to live with. He honors even a cup of cold water given in his name. And then my faith is built up when I accept God's growth pattern in my life, number eight. He's working in different people in different ways. I have a hyper acceptance of myself. I needed it. Because my kind of character is not easy to accept. Especially in England. American, loudmouth, skinny, long nose. Aggressive, hostile, impatient, bombastic, judgmental, all the natural negative traits of the choleric temperament. Is there any hope for my kind? I talked to people years ago, they're very encouraging. They said, Look, uh, there's actually no hope for you, but uh, press on anyway. <laughs> you know, some people have a ministry of encouragement, others just seem to be gifted with a ministry of discouragement. Have you ever met any of those? Get as far away from, away from them as you can. Don't surround yourself with negative people. Choose at least among your friends a few optimists, a few people who believe God is still on the throne when man is making a mess. Well, that's just a tip. Just a tip of what the Word of God says on this subject. And I hope with these books and these tapes you'll just 
especially with the Word of God, go on and on and on in building up your faith in a balanced and biblical way so that whatever storm breaks through in your life, you will stand firm and you'll keep on keeping on.